Bibles and open them to Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. Men are ready to serve you with those. Doing a Bible study on the book of Leviticus. And it's going to be just that little more study than sometimes we normally do on preaching, but it's it's both go preaching and teaching and going through the book of Leviticus. Again, it's a challenging book. It's an interesting book. And God has got it in there for a reason. Uh, uh, he didn't have to put it in there. He could have had it somewhere else, but He's got it in there for us today. So looking at Leviticus chapter 2, do a brief review and then get right into the new material. And tonight we're talking about do not forget the salt. Do not, if you want to add that in there, don't ever forget the salt. Don't ever forget the salt. So when we read through here, let the, the salt jump out at you. And we're going to be looking at the entire uh, meat offering. But uh, in particular, we're looking at tonight, the main takeaway is the salt. Leviticus chapter 2. And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, this offering shall be of fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it, and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and he shall take thereout his handful of flour thereof, and of the oil thereof, and all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar, to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. And if thou bring an oblation of a meat offering, bacon in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in a pan, it shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mingled with oil. Thou shalt part it in pieces, and pour oil thereon, it is a meat offering. And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in the frying pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. And thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord, and when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar." And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven, for ye shall not burn no, for ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in any offering of the Lord made by fire. As for the oblation of the first fruits, ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. And every oblation of thy meat offering thou shalt, shalt thou season with salt, neither salt, neither shalt thou salt suffer the salt to be of the covenant of thy I'm sorry, my eyes are not well tonight. Verse thirteen And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. And if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruit green ears of corn dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. And thou shalt put oil thereon, put oil upon it, and lay frankincense thereon. It is a meat offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the oil thereof, and all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Father, we ask you to help us tonight. Lord, an amazing book you've given to us, and we're in a book that's not often studied, that's not often looked at. But Lord, we know it's there for our instruction. So God, I ask that you help us learn tonight. Lord, you've helped me in some areas if I studied that and Lord, I pray that you'll just keep these truths that we look at tonight fresh in our minds and fresh in our hearts. And as we leave here, we'll be a little more excited about who you are, a little more excited about what you have for us, and a little more careful about how we worship you. Thank you for folks able to be here tonight. So, Lord, I pray that you just meet with us like you promised. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The book of Leviticus just like the name implies, deals with the Levites, the priests of the Old Testament, the priests of the tabernacle, the tent that God had Moses set up, which was a picture, is modeled in heaven. God showed him a model of what was in heaven, and Moses was to make it there on earth. And that's what we find 
Uh, in fact, if you flip back to the end of Exodus, just before we get into Leviticus, it talks about there in, in Exodus 40, verse 36, And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in their journey. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And so we find that they had just finished the tabernacle, and now they're going, they'd watch for the cloud, they'd watch for the fire. When it moved, they moved. So they built a tabernacle, and now God is giving instructions for the particular offerings and the operations of the Levites. Uh, throughout, as we go through Leviticus, which has got lots of general teachings also about morality and about priests and about family and many other things. But right now, these first five to eight chapters deal with the offerings, particular offerings, specific offerings. Now, the theme we saw last week, really, for the entire book is, Be ye holy. Be ye holy. That's what it's talking about. Leviticus 20, verse 7, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. So He sanctifies us, and we're to be holy because He's our God, and He is holy. Uh, we have to really get down to the place where we realize that we are not just Americans, we're not just people, we're not just mom and dads, uh, but we are God's people. And because God is holy, and He is our God, we're to be holy like Him, and then He sanctifies us. And so, uh, I think it's 195 times the word holy is used in Leviticus, so God wants us to be holy. Now, as we look at the offerings, as we look at Leviticus, I believe it was in your notes before, 2 Timothy 3.16, very familiar passage, where it says, all Scripture. Leviticus is Scripture. Leviticus is there for our purpose, and so tonight as we go through even this meat offering, we're going to be looking for some things. So if you just want to highlight those things or write it down when you see it, it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for our doctrine. So as we look through Leviticus, look for doctrine. As we look at the message tonight, look for doctrine. Truths, teachings, things that will help us, things that will strengthen us, keep us that things that will build our faith. So for doctrine. So you might want to say, well, that's a good doctrinal point. For reproof, uh-oh, I've messed up, I've gone away, I've strayed away, I've backslidden. So if you see that in there where God says, this is where you're lacking, this is where you need to improve, you write that down. For correction, how to get it right, what we need to put in our lives, as well as what we need to take away from our lives, instruction in righteousness, how to live right. So we see that, we can write that down, this is instruction in righteousness. And it says that the man of God may be perfect or mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we're seeing these, the doctrine, the reproof, the correction, the instruction in righteousness, and helping us for good works. So as we study this, this is going to help us in our Sunday school classes, this will help us in our singing, this will help us in our ministry, this will help us in discipleship, it will help us in all things, because if we'll glean from what God has for us, then we will be able to gain those truths. So we see the overall overview of the offerings we saw the purpose uh, is really two-pronged. It's for redemption and relationship. It talks about our salvation and then our relationship with God. How many are glad we can be, have a relationship with Him? Not just be redeemed, not just say we're saved, but we have that relationship. And also we find it's an obligation or an opportunity, an obligation to find forgiveness and an opportunity to worship. So as we look tonight, if you look there in verse number 13 is the key about don't ever forget the salt. Don't ever forget the salt. We're going to get down to it. It's going to be toward the end of the message as we look at this meat offering. But in Leviticus 2.13 it says, In every oblation, that's gift, whatever you give, that offering, of thy meat offering, thou shalt season it with salt. Neither shall thy suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. He says, don't you ever try to make a meat offering without the salt. Don't forget the salt. Always have the salt in. But he goes on and says, with all thine offerings, not just the meat offering, but with all thine offerings, thou shalt offer salt. So God is making an emphasis here about the salt. So we're going to see tonight about how God does not want us to forget the salt, what the salt means to us, how the salt will help us minister. And so we're looking at the meat offering and the salt. So very quickly, some, just some simple teachings from the Word of God. Again, Bible teachings has one interpretation, but multiple applications and illustrations. And so even as Jesus gives those examples, that's what we're going to see tonight. So if you'll stay awake, stay alert, we'll learn about don't forget the salt. How many have ever forgotten the salt? Yes. 
How many ever had dinner without the salt? He'd say, oh, my. Doctors don't want you to have a lot of salt, but God likes salt. And so he's got these offerings with the salt. So very quickly, looking at the meat offering. First of all, the picture in the meat offering. The picture in the meat offering. What is God trying to picture? What is God trying to show us? What is the illustration He has for us? Now, as you read through there, talking about the meat offering, you might say, where's the meat? The meat offering is not about meat. The meat offering is a meal offering. It's a bread offering, if you will. And so it's not meat. There's no blood in it. It's just, it's, it's, it's meal. It's bread. We saw that God says they could, they could cook it several different ways. They could fry it up. They could bake it up. They could do what, lots of ways. He said, but he gave specific instructions. So the meat offering is not meat. It's meal. It's bread. It's a corn. It's a wheat type of offering. So keeping that in mind. So we find, first of all, the symbolism of the meat offering. The symbolism of the meat offering. And we're going to compare this with the burnt offering. We saw in verse chapter 1, the burnt offering. The taking of the animal and putting the hands on it and taking the blood of it and sprinkling it around and then uh, burning the body completely and burning the inters, uh, the internal parts of it, just completely burning over it. Nobody get to, got to eat that meat. They didn't keep any of that meat. They didn't keep any of the parts. It was completely burned up. And we'll find later what they did with the ashes. But it was, that's the burnt offering. And then we come in chapter 2 with this meat offering. So very quickly, as we think about what God is trying to show us here, this is being a picture. We know the whole Bible is about Christ. The whole Bible is giving us instruction. The whole Bible points to, to Christ. We find, first of all, the symbolism in the meat offering. Number one, and I apologize, I think my, my outline and my uh, slides are a little bit disjointed, so you'll have to stay awake, all right? You'll have to think. The burnt offering represents Christ as the sacrifice for sinners. The burnt offering, chapter 1, represents Christ as the sacrifice for sinners. It was the blood. If you remember, the man came, whoever came would put his hands on the animal, representing, yes, I've sinned, yes, I need a Savior, yes, I need some help, and I'm transferring my sin, my iniquity, to this animal, and they would take the animal and slay it. In fact, he himself would slay the animal. The priest wouldn't do it, but he himself would kill the animal that he just laid his hands on, and the priest would then would take the blood and sprinkle it and burn it. So the burnt offer, offer, offering represented Christ as the sacrifice for sinner. The meat offering, however, represents his intercession for the saints, represents his intercession for the saints. Because now we've got a different thing. We've got the sacrifice and now the intercession. In Hebrews 10, 12, it talks about the burnt offering, if you will, representing Christ. But this man, talking about Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. I'm so glad it was just one time. I'm glad he doesn't have to go to the cross again. I'm glad that after all those thousands of years of, of sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, it's done. It was done. And he sat down at the right hand of God. In Romans 8, 34, he goes on and says... Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So he sacrificed for us. He was our sacrifice. He rose and ascended and sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he's at the right hand of the Father, according to Romans, making intercession for us. I'm glad he's there making intercession for us. So when we look at the, 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 the meat offering, following the burnt offering, it's about him interceding for us. It's a whole different paradigm as far as the offerings go. The first one was very bloody. The first one was very stressful, if you'd like to put it that way, but this one is quite different. Secondly, we find the burnt offering represents Christ's finished work. The burnt offering represents Christ's finished work. It was done. Just like that animal was completely slayed, completely burned up, it was all gone. It was all done. There was no lingering parts except for those ashes. The meal offering represents his fellowship. The meal offering represents his fellowship because it's bread. And as you watch the disciples and you read about the disciples, there was a lot of fellowshipping around food. That's how you know they were Baptists, all right? They just fellowshiped around the food. In fact, Jesus, uh, when he rose from the dead that first night, he says, you got any meat? First thing, he said, boy, let's, let's eat because he represented that fellowship. So the burnt offering represents Christ's finished work, but the meal offering represents His fellowship. In John 21, 9, As soon then as they were come to land, this is after the resurrection, and when Jesus was appearing before them, 
they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. So that fellowship, that food, that there's a certain relationship that's built around meals. There's a certain fellowship, a certain peace, a certain unity around meals. How many have figured that out? It is it, in families, in friends, and in church fellowships. That's one of the difficulties we're having now is with the COVID and people being afraid to eat each other's food or sample each other's food or pass each other's food. It's just, it's, it's a challenging time. Uh, the fellowship is hurting. The fellowship is not being met like it ought to be. We have to work about that and make sure that we compensate by prayer and compensate by contacting people. But that's another message. In John 21, 12, Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. And none of his disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord Jesus, then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. So the meal offering here with the bread represents that fellowship. So we've got the sacrifice, which is the finished work, the sacrifices, which is the atoning, and then the fellowship associated with this thing. Fellowshipping with God, blessing with God, unity with God. Very quickly, the burnt offering reminds us of his blood sacrifice. The burnt offering reminds us of his blood sacrifice. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we have that sacrifice, that burnt offering where they take the blood, they kill it, sprinkle the blood, burn up the body. That's his sacrifice broken body. That's His blood, His blood sacrifice. But the meat offering reminds us He is the bread of life. He is the bread of life. Yes, He's the bullock, if you will. He's the bull of sacrifice, but also He is the bread of life. Jesus several set times said, I am the bread of life. Do you understand what this, the, the difference in pictures is God's taking us through? This wonderful Savior we have. So we find then the the symbolism. Yeah, notice if you would the sequence of the meat offering. The sequence of the meat offering. When you compare the burnt offering and the meat offering. The meat offering comes after the burnt offering. There is no blood in this meat offering. But as you study through about the different times they have the meat offering, even though there's no blood in the meat offering, it's always around the blood. And it's always, almost always, after the burnt offering. In other words, there's no fellowship without the sacrifice. There is no, you want to say, we got the sacrifice. Until we get saved, until we've been born again, until we're His child, we don't have that relationship. We don't have that fellowship. We don't have that closeness it's always after the blood so there's no blood but it's always very near the blood even as the case here he said this is what you do he says you've got the burnt offering and he said now you've got the meat offering which is fellowship which is bread which is something else all together so the burnt offering is the requirement for redemption the burnt offering is requirement for redemption uh, re redemption if you're going to be redeemed you had to bring that animal that animal was for atonement it was the blood it had to be there that blood offering that burnt offering was a requirement for redemption that's why hebrews 9 22 says and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood there is no remission it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves better sacrifices than these. So the heavenly things, we're talking about with the blood. The blood. Well, I can't imagine. You know, I've done some hunting. I've had, we had our farm in Texas, a little farmette, and so I've butchered a fair number of animals and killed some animals and got the blood and whatnot. Over there. But I can't imagine the millions of Jews and the blood that must have gone on during those sacrifices. But it was a reminder to them, without the shedding of blood... There is no remission. Without the Jesus shedding His blood on the cross, there is no salvation. It's that blood that He shed for us. And so the burnt offering represents or is the requirement for redemption. The meat offering is the response of the redeemed. The meat offering is the response of the redeemed. In other words, it's the praise. It's the glory. It's the offering back to Him. And so it's not a blood offering, it's not a sacrifice, it's an offering unto the Lord. It's that response of, 
man, I've been redeemed. I've been saved. I just got done, or maybe just some time before, I put my hand on that animal, and we slew the animal, and the blood was there, and they took off the blood, and they sprinkled it where they're supposed to, and they took the animal and laid it on the wood and burned it up. Boy, my, I've been a cleansed. I've been saved, if you would, in the New Testament vernacular. He said, but I've been redeemed. I've been paid for. Wow, now I can offer freely this meat offering this grain offering this bread offering it's praise and it's glory so we've got a wonderful picture here of this meat offering it's praise it's glory it's thanks it's in response to the fact that i've had the blood offering already and so god takes them through this sequence now very quickly the practical lessons of the meat offering the practical lessons so we've seen some doctrine already now we're going to learn some things that will help us with that correction and reproof and instruction and in righteousness the practical lessons of the meat offering number one we find the lessons in the substance the lessons in the substance now my wife will tell you this story about while she was sick years ago our kids would say mom you got to get well and get daddy out of the kitchen. I would start with the recipe. But I would just start and I'd say, I don't know what this spice is, but I, it'd probably be pretty good. And so I'd put some in. I thought, I'm not sure what this does, but I will do that. I was making a cake. I remember making the cake. And it said, put, beat it for three minutes. And I thought, if a cake is going to be good if you beat it for three minutes, it'll be really good if you beat it for 35 didn't work that way so recipes were there for a reason recipes were given for a purpose god gives them a recipe on how to do it god gives them a recipe and so we look at the lessons in substance in other words what was the meat offering what was this bread offering made of what was it and we see this again is all there for our instruction in righteousness and for our reproof and correction so let's look at le lessons from the substance of the meat offering number one first of all from what was excluded what was excluded god made a point not just what was in there but what was not to be in there he said i don't want you to go tinkering with the recipe like this guy does he says don't, don't put this in there this is not to be in your meat offering this is not to be in your bread this is not to be in your boston cream pie this is not to be however they however you made it because he gave you all kinds of ways to make it first of all so lessons from what was excluded what was excluded number one leaven he says you don't make it with leaven you don't make it with leaven in fact, uh, let's just read a couple of places in Matthew 16. We know that leaven in the Bible typically is a picture of what class? Sin. It's a picture of sin. Jesus warned over and over about leaven. He's saying, yeah, so God here says when you have this meal offering, this praise offering, this worship, He says you do not, you do not put leaven in it. In Matthew 16 and verse number 6, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, Pharisees and Sadducees, were they religious people? Well, they were religious. They were wrong, but they were religious. I mean, they just went to the nth degree. And people would look to them, so they were the spiritual leaders. They were wrong. But he said, Beware of them. So they've got leaven. So there can be some leaven. There can be some false doctrine. There can be false teaching, even with the religious people. And they reasoned them among themselves, saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? You can tell they're Baptists. They're just worried about lunch. He says, Is he talking about lunch already? We just had. Verse 8. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? And he goes on and begins to reprove them. And then he goes down a little bit farther. Then, verse 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of leaven of bread but of the doctrine of the pharisees and sadducees and so the leaven so what was excluded from that offering that meat offering of praise and thanksgiving it was leaven in uh first corinthians 5 6 but your glory is not good know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump is that little bit of sin that little bit of false doctrine that little bit of wrong just a little bit he said Leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So we have to take out that leaven. So we get a lesson here. This meal offering, 
this meat offering, this bread offering, he says, you do not put leaven in it. It's unleavened bread. But we need to make sure that while we're giving praise and while we're giving thanks and while we're ministering to God and offering our sacrifices and offering our praise, that we make sure that our worship services in our time are without leaven without leaven, without false doctrine, without sin in our heart, without sin in our life. That's why we always, at the Lord's Supper, we'll always make sure we pause to make sure there's no unconfessed sin, but we've got to remove the leaven. So lessons from the substance that we have this meat offering, what's excluded is leaven, no sin. Let's keep the sin out. Don't let just a little bit, don't let any in it. So if they brought that meal offering and they said, well, I'm going to put just a little leaven in it. No, no, none, none. So we learn lessons from the substance. We don't worship with leaven. No sin. No false doctrine. No error. Now, will we sin? Yes. But we do not keep it there. Do we have false doctrine sometimes? We get a little confused. If we're not careful, we will get confused. But we have to search it out and remove it. So we learn from the substance. Exclude leaven. Boy, that's why we have to be so careful. We exclude that in our worship. We will never We will never have, as by God's grace, and far as I'm standing here, we'll never have the Mormon... Tabernacle choir sing right here. They may sound good, but they're not going to be singing here. We don't want a little bit of leaven. We're not going to have the Mormon. We're not going to have a Mormon preacher stand behind the pulpit. We just can't do that. We're not going to do it because we can't have any leaven. So we learn. He says God said made it very careful. He says no leaven. So in our worship, in our praise, no leaven, no sin. And also he said no honey, no honey. You know I like honey, but he said no honey. He said no honey in any offering that will be burned with fire. And I began to think about that, and I guess honey breaks down odd when it gets heated, when it gets cooked, and it can ferment over time. But I think when we think about honey, we think about sweetness. God says, I don't need any artificial sweetness. Don't need to add extra sweetness to it. Did you ever meet somebody who was just so sweet they just dripped with it? But they really weren't sincere? He said, you don't need to add that. He said, I want a sweet-smelling savor. He said, I get the sweetness from something else. I get the sweetness from your obedience to me. I, in other words, he said, I get the sweetness not from the honey he might put in there, but from a contrite and broken spirit, from an honest, sincere spirit, from a holy reverence to, to me. He said, don't, no, don't put the extra drips in there. Well, let's make sure that our worship, if you will, is not, you better add a little bit of honey to it. You ever meet somebody or hear some preacher sometimes that, boy, they just, you can tell they just kind of dumped in a bunch of honey on there. That's not how they normally talk. It's not how they normally think. No, God said, I don't want that. He said, I want the sweet-smelling savor, but no with honey. So we get some lessons from the substance, what's excluded. But what's included is also a lesson because God makes it clear what He wants in there. I like the idea. It was fine meal, fine meal. He said, I want the good stuff. I want to, he says, don't, he said, don't go down to the grocery store and find what's on sale. He says, no, I want the finely ground stuff. I want the good stuff. He said, what you worship with me, it's going to be something right and it's going to be good. Also, it's got the oil. The oil, we know the oil is a picture of what class? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So he said, I, we need that oil. You're going to have oil in it. He said, if you bake it this way, he said, you put oil in it. If you cook it this way, you pour oil on top. If you put it this way, you have oil on the side. He said, but it's got to have oil in it. And oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. So let our thanks and our praise, our meal offering, our meat offering, our praising to God for fellowship, we make sure it's got the Holy Spirit in it. Boy, we've got to have to have some Holy Spirit work in our ministry, some Holy Spirit working in our private lives, in our worship, and tomorrow morning when you get up and spend time with God, let's make sure you got some oil in there. When you're starting thanking God and praising God, one of the things on my prayer list is thankfulness. I just want to thankful and praise, and so I pause and do that. But God says, when you do that, have oil in it. Have oil with it. Have oil in it. Just the, the Holy Spirit. But then He says, not only that, He said, but you need frankincense in it frankincense in it you know frankincense is that thing that makes that aroma particularly when it burned they would make incense with a certain procedure god gave later on in in the book and it talks about making with incense so the incense there that frankincense makes that incense who it's praise it's glory it's worship it's what brings on that sweet smelling savor besides that of of the cooking itself that frankincense making it sweet Boy, let our praise, our glory, our worship, our meat offering to the Lord be with frankincense. Praise, glory, worship, just rising up and going. All that 
I wonder if God smells anything good when we pray. I wonder if God smells anything good when we get alone with Him. Or we just go through the motions. He said, boy, you've got to have the frankincense in there. Now, so we have lessons from the substance. The one substance I left out we're going to look at separately, and that's the lessons in the salt. The lessons in the salt. Because God's focus is on the salt. It's part of the ingredients. But as we saw the first verse, as we looked at it in verse number, I think it was 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering, that praise, that glory, that fellowship, symbolized by the meat offering, thou shalt season with salt. Neither shall I suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. He says, don't hold back on the salt. Don't keep the salt. Don't forget the salt. He said, it's got to come with salt, and don't forget it. Don't forget the salt. And then he goes on, with all thine offerings, all the offerings, not just the meat offerings, but all thy offerings, thou shalt offer salt. So God wants this salt, this idea of salt. He wants them to make sure that when the priest is there, he says, you got the salt in. I imagine when they brought that meal offering and said, here's the, here's the cakes, here's the bread I've made, he probably said, got frankincense in it? Yeah. Got any leaven in it? No, no, good. Got oil in it? Yeah, I see the oil. Did you forget the salt? Don't forget the salt. Can't miss the salt. So we're looking here at the lessons of the salt. It's in everything. All offerings. So as we look at the salt and see what it represents, we have to understand that in all our worship, we've got to have that salt. In all our ministry, we've got to have that salt. He said, in all your offerings, regardless of how you're offering, he said, you need to have that salt. So in our singing, we need to bring on the salt. In our worship, we need to bring on the salt. In our teaching, we need to have that salt. In our preaching, we need to have that salt. In our soul winning, we need to have that salt. In our loving of others, we've got to have that salt. So we're looking at this idea that in everything we have, we need to have that salt. I was trying, and I've been looking, and I've been praying, and I'm still gleaning from the Scriptures some things about what that salt is. But the Bible talks about let our speech always be with grace seasoned with salt i believe it's a picture of the grace of god in our lives god's grace that salt that 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 unique grace that supernatural working of god in our lives that supernatural pleasantness in our lives that grace of god i believe it represents the presence of god because we're salted there it's god's presence it's god's grace it's god's power in our life it's the unction of god that 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 brings out the flavor that brings out the excitement it's just Jesus Christ is that salt, all wrapped up in Him. Is there? He said, so you've got to have the salt in it. So very quickly, all the offerings with salt, because number one, it is precious. Why would He want the salt in it? Because it's precious. You know, we have salt, that we buy it pretty cheap, and we don't worry much about it. But back then, they didn't have that. It was very precious. In fact, our word salary, from what I understand, comes from the word meaning salt. They would pay soldiers with salt. It was very, very valuable. They'd exchange in salt. They'd have salt bars and salt groups. And so it was precious. And so, so when you come with salt, you're putting something precious into your offering. You're putting something precious into your worship. You're putting something of value into it. I wonder if we're putting in any salt in our worship. When we worship, when we pray, when we sing, are we putting anything precious into it? Are we putting any kind of emphasis into it? Are we putting any kind of power into it? Does it cost us anything? I preached on this not long ago. In fact, David deals with that very issue about the meat offering and how precious and its cost. It says in 1 Chronicles 21, 23, when David was going to have to sacrifice, God said, I need you to have a sacrifice down at the threshing floor. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee oxen also for the burnt offering, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. He said, I'm going to give you the oxen, for the burnt offering, the sacrifice. And he says, I'll give you the wheat for the meat offering that comes after the sacrifice. So you sacrifice, saying, I praise God for the, for the blood sacrifice, the atoning, and now I'm going to worship with the meat offering that comes and follows that, that fellowship, that praise, that glory. He said, and I'll give you the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. And King David said unto Onan, Nay, 
but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor burnt offerings without cost. He says, no. He says, you can't give it to me. I've got to buy it. It's got to be precious, that meat offering. Meat offering is going to require that salt. He says, I've got to pay the price for it. So we find the lessons in salt. All offerings with salt, all because it's precious. So whether it's a big offering or a small offering, it's got to be precious. It's going to have that cost, if you will. It's going to have something value to it in our lives and offering it unto God. Secondly, all offerings with salt because it's preserving. It's preserving. We know salt preserves. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have freezers. So it was a preserving element. Well, aren't you glad we're preserved? Aren't you glad the offering of Christ, that we're worshiping Him and it's just a, a permanency? It's an offering with made all offerings with salt because it reminds us of His promises. Of His promises. We find there in Leviticus, it talked about, we'll look at it again, verse number 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering thou shalt season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God. The salt of the covenant of thy God. Elsewhere in the scripture it talks about a covenant of salt. It's a promise. He said, this covenant of salt, this salt represents my promises. This salt represents my covenants. This salt represents my promises to you and, the, and your trust in my word. We're not going to look at all the covenants. That'd be an, that's an interesting study we'll do. But we're looking at the covenant of salt. It's His promises. It's His promises. Very quickly, we find, first of all, it's a promise to the provision for the priest. A promise for provision for the priest. In Numbers 18, 18. And the flesh of them shall be thine... As the wave breast and as the right shoulder are thine, all the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee by a statute forever. He's talking to the priest. He said, this, you're going to get the meat offering. He said, you're, this is how I'm going to provide for you. The people will bring the offerings. And for the other offerings, not the burnt offering, but these others, as we'll see even for the meat offering, he says, you get to have some of it. By statute forever, it is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. So it was a promise. The covenant of salt was a promise for provision. He said, I'm going to make sure you get provided for. I'm going to make sure that you have that meat that you need. I'm going to make sure you have that food that you need. It is a covenant of salt forever. And God has made us kings and priests in Christ Jesus. So we then in our ministry, we then in our service, and we in our worship with God, it's going to be a provision for us as we minister. By the way, if the priests weren't ministering, guess what? They didn't get the provision. If the feasts were, priests weren't worshiping, they weren't getting the provision. They got the provision because they were doing their duty there and their sons. And as they ministered and the people brought in the worship, they got to have that. If they say, well, I'm going to back out for a while. I don't think I'm going to do it. They're going to miss out. So it's a covenant of salt forever before the Lord. So it's a promise of provision. So all the offerings had to be with salt because it was represented the promises, the promise of provision. It was also a promise for Christ's eternal rule. For Christ's eternal rule. In 2 Chronicles 13, 5, Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over to Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? A covenant of salt. A promise of salt. An agreement with salt. For, for what? The kingdom to David and to his sons forever. In other words, Christ is going to rule forever. So as they, as they had that covenant of salt, they understood God was making promises. God says, I'm making a deal with you based upon this salt, based upon this deal of salt. They didn't know about what was all that was going to come, but they represented His promises, His covenant. And God says, don't leave out the covenant of salt. Don't leave out the salt of my promises. All offerings with salt because of His promises. All offerings with salt because it makes things palatable. It makes things palatable. Most of us like a little salt on our food. Some of us like a lot of salt on the food. Some like salt on everything. But salt makes it palatable. He says, don't forget the salt. Always have the offerings with salt. In fact, Job 6, 6 tells us, Can that which is unsavory, 
be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? I got news for you. Without salt, there is no taste in the white of an egg. Uh, uh, I eat a lot of egg whites uh, in my life now, and so I have an egg white sandwich. But I got news for you. If you don't put the salt in there, and you don't put the pepper in there, and you don't uh, put some other little spice, there's not, there's, no, there's not much taste in the white of an egg. And so this salt brings out flavor where there is none. The salt brings out joy, if you will, where there is none. And that's why he says, can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? In other words, you put salt on it and it makes it savory. Something you can handle, something you can take, something that makes it tasty, something that goes from something that's unsavory, untasty, unpalatable to something that is palatable when you put the salt. So God says, as you worship me, as you give thanks to me, as you in your life, he said, in all your offerings, not just the meal offering, but in all the offerings, he said, make sure you've got salt in it because it'll make those times palatable. I'm talking about, so we, we bring the salt to our offerings. That'll make some hard doctrine palatable. You know, there's some things in the Bible you read and say, boy, that's too hard. No, if I've got the salt, if you will, if I've got the grace of God, the power of God, the presence of Christ, all those things that that salt represents that we must have, then I'm going to find those hard teachings. Yes, it's hard teachings. Yes, it's hard doctrine, but it's palatable. I can eat it. I can take it because it is still right because I've got the presence of God, the power of God, and the grace of God. It makes that hard doctrine palatable. It makes the hard decisions to obey God palatable if we've got the salt, His grace, His presence, His power, His person upon Him. It makes the sacrifices that we might be asked to make for the cause of Christ palatable. Why? Because it's the power of God, the grace of God. All our worship and all offerings as we offer our lives to Christ and say, how can I do that and make it palatable? I've got to have the salt. Just put on the salt of Christ, the salt of His presence, the salt of His love, the salt that we must have. The sufferings, Hebrews 11, how could they, the, the saints of Hebrews 11, how in the world could they go through that? It was with salt. Don't forget the salt. Don't ever forget the salt in our worship, in our praise, in our offering. All your offerings with salt. With salt. Next time your worship gets a little untasty, pour on the salt. Well, it doesn't seem to get anything out of it anymore. Did you forget the salt? Did you forget the salt? All the offerings with salt. Very quickly, it's also a lesson in stewardship. It's lessons in stewardship. Verse 14. And if thou offer a meat offering, again, it's not meat, it's just bread, of thy first fruits unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruit green ears of corn dried by the fire, even corn beaten out to full ears. First fruits, as you know, you're supposed to give the first fruits to God. In other words, been a tough winter got no food got just a little bit we just got a little bit that's going to make us through and here comes the harvest god says the first fruits are mine don't put them in your refrigerator don't put them in your storage bin don't you put them in your he says no they're mine it's a lesson in stewardship these first fruits of the meal offering he said even in the grain even in the corn well even while it's green give it to me What's exciting also about the meal offering is that's how, as we saw already, the priest got fed. He would bring the meal offering and he would take some of it and burn it. But what was left over, the priest would take. He'd break it home for dinner, take it home for his kids. Sharing in the worship, sharing in the fellowship, it's just God's plan. But it's about bringing in the tithe, it's stewardship. It's stewardship. Don't forget the salt. The meat offering, which is no meat, follows the burnt offering. We can only have the fellowship. We can only have the praise. We can only have that, that relationship after the burnt offering. So we got the burnt offering is the sacrifice. The meal offering is the praise and the fellowship. Doctrine, reproof, correction. Don't forget the salt. All your offerings with salt. Let's bow our heads, please.